market report. You know, over the next few minutes, myself and then Kate Rezebeck is going to join here in just a minute um, to talk about what's most important in this housing market. You know, we'll start off talking about one of the biggest issues, and that is affordability and what it's leading to, uh, which is smaller homes being built. And I'll give you the facts on that. Second, we're going to talk about Gen Z and this question of, will I be able to buy a, a home if I'm a young person right now? There's a lot of information out on that. There's a lot of misinformation too. Uh, and Kate will wrap things up talking about mortgage rates. We're going to give you the best information we have for what is happening right now so that you can be the advisor, the trusted advisor uh, for those that you serve. So with that as a backdrop, let's go ahead and get started on this May monthly market report. Okay. You know, we always start these off saying most agents know what's happening. The good agents understand what's happening but the great agents can explain what's happening. You know, that's why we exist at Keeping Current Matters is to give you the information so that you can explain exactly what's happening in this market. You know, if you were here in our office uh, in Richmond, Virginia, we have the wall that says we believe every family should feel confident when buying and selling a home. And, you know, one of the things that I think is uh, top of mind for many, many people right now is the idea of affordability and what that means for homes. And so I wanna spend just a few minutes as we get started here talking about that and talking about what builders are doing to respond in this market to the affordability crisis. You know, and if you look at affordability, we like to use NARS Housing Affordability Index. This goes all the way back to 1990. And the facts today are that homes are less affordable today than any time going back in this graphic here, back to 1990. You know, you see the bars in the middle there, uh, the years when distressed properties dominated the market post 2008. And if you've been in the business long enough, you know about that, or maybe you heard about it, if you weren't in the business, but we sit a point with rising prices, rising mortgage rates that homes are less affordable. And so builders are having to respond to that. You know, we've talked about builders on the monthly market report before and how in this market through a lot of different uh, ways have won and have have provided solutions to um, to what uh, consumers need. And that's certainly what, what I believe they're trying to do right now. But the bottom line is builders are building smaller homes. More than a third of builders, 38%, say they built smaller homes in 2023. And more than a quarter plan to construct even smaller this year. So this is a direct response to what is happening in the market. You know, back in the years of COVID 2021, uh, 22, we saw record low uh, mortgage rates, 30-year fixed falling to two and three quarters, and people could afford more. But as prices have gone up, Mortgage rates have gone up. Affordability has suffered. People cannot afford as much. And so builders are responding to that by building um, uh, smaller homes. You know, the, the National Association of Home Builders, uh, Rose Quint says this, it's related to two factors that are linked. First, we see changes in home buyer preferences. Second, housing affordability has worsened in recent years, uh, like uh, what I just talked about. But the preference, many people saying, you know what, we don't want maybe as large of a home or the uh, also the reality that the starter home segment in real estate um, has not been there over the last several years. You know, more custom homes, more larger homes due to a number of different factors. One of those being uh, people can afford more. But when you start to look at, you know, square footage of homes, let me go back to that. It looks like this from 2003 uh, on up, you can see uh, square footage coming down. And a lot of that related to um, what's happened in uh, the affordability of homes across the country. But no doubt, home buyers want smaller homes. Builders are building smaller homes. Um, the National Association of Home Builders said this as well. After a brief increase during the post-COVID building boom, Housing size is trending lower and likely continue to do so as housing affordability remains constrained. And, and you see it very, very clearly. Great graphic coming up here uh, on what new single family homes look like. And you, you take kind of 2020, this is by quarter on the average square footage during the during the pandemic going all the way up to 2022, you see square footage starting to come down. Now that is good news. For folks that are out there looking, say, hey, you know, you know, we can afford less or we need something a little bit smaller that they can now uh, find more options 
you know, I think what we see in an in, in active inventory, new inventory coming to market across the country is more of that is new construction than what we've seen in prior years. Um, the New York Times said this, the downsizing accelerated last year when the interest rate on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage reached a two-decade high just shy of 8%. And so, you know, we see this across the board. We see this happening, uh, and, uh, and it is a welcome sign, I believe, for consumers. You know, the average square footage today uh, of just over 2,400 square feet is down 10% since 2018. And again, you know, this this sort of drop happening in direct response to rising mortgage rates, rising um, in affordability in homes across the country. Um, I, I think in, in a lot of categories, in a lot of areas, builders have managed to navigate this market, whether it be through incentives, maybe mortgage rate buy downs, and now in building smaller homes. And that's a welcome sign for, for many consumers. Um, you know, Charlie at Creative Planning says home builders are adapting to the lowest affordability on record by building smaller homes and offering more incentives and price cuts. And that certainly is true. So my message today is if you're not working with a builder, you should develop uh, relationships with builders. You know, and, and many people listen to the monthly market report, whether it be, you know, a loan officer or an agent. And there certainly are opinions about working with builders, but no doubt it is an option for people uh, that are out there looking today with limited inventory in most areas of the country. Um, and and I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. Our, our job always at the monthly market report is bringing the facts and the data, but also to say, what are areas of opportunity? What are areas you can look at right now and say, okay, that's an area of opportunity. Where am I at? And that is a solution for the clients that I serve. I'll wrap up this. Uh, John Burns Consulting, they do a phenomenal job. Michaela says it's not solving the affordability crisis, but it is creating opportunities for people to be able to afford an entry-level home in an area, and that's critically important. And if you get that size down, the affordability will make it uh, a more, or that will automatically make it a more affordable home. And so that is a good thing. A lot of talk about affordability, a lot of talk about rising prices, a lot of talk about rising mortgage rates. Builders are responding with a different type of product, a smaller uh, product that makes things more affordable for people. You know, when we talk about affordability and one of the issues that is out there, and it's near and dear to my heart, uh, is younger people uh, under the age of 25, Gen Z, wondering Will I be able to buy a home? And this, I said, was near and dear to my heart. It's it's that because I have three Gen Zers, two that are in college, one in high school, and I have had individual conversations prompted by them on will I be able to buy a home? It's getting more expensive to buy a home. Will that be something that, that, that I can do? And my answer to them is you absolutely will. It's more expensive, but you can do it. And, and the reason that I'm you know, so um, uh, direct with them. And that is because on social media and other platforms that are out there in the world, news and all that, um, they're being told they can't. And I think our job right now is to show Gen Z and show younger people how you can, you know, just to sort of give an underscore to it, Gen Z is the population born between 1997 and um, 2012, right here, are these blue bars, anybody from 10 years old right now to maybe 24. So people that are, uh, you know, not at, certainly not at home buying age, but entering into it uh, on the higher side, right? If you're 10 years old, you're not looking for a home, but if you're 22, 23, 24 years old, people are starting uh, to buy at that age. And many of them wondering, is the the dream of home ownership dead for me? I think we need to be vocal about this, um, uh, this topic with people that we serve, because I, I think no matter what, you know, what area you're in, you know, people or, or maybe, have family members in this category that we can help. You know, if you look at population, Gen Z is right behind millennials, but um, make up about, you know, roughly 20% millennials, 20% Gen Z, 20% Gen X and baby boomer. You see that roughly broken down that way. And, And they are the generation coming up that is, um, you know, sort of wondering if the American dream is still alive for them. And they're very good reason for it. One of the biggest reasons that they ask this question is the reality 
that the cost of buying a home has risen dramatically over the last several years. And I'll give you just a, an example of that. The average monthly payment in this country this is a principal and interest example from 2019 to today has gone from just over $1,000 to just over $2,000. It's doubled. Okay. And so if you're, if you're out there looking, you're, you're somebody that's coming in, maybe trying to get a job and I want to buy a home and thinking about life that way, you're concerned. And I think there's very real reason to be concerned uh, in this area, but I think there are reasons to be optimistic as well. And, and let me get into that and, and maybe break down a little bit of who's buying right now and what are the things you can do to help somebody in uh, in this area. Start with a quote from Chase. Um, they said this, uh, the turbulent economy of the last few years has left more than a few people wondering, will Gen Z be able to afford houses? And the short answer and the good news is probably yes. Despite some potential trepidation surrounding home ownership, first time home buyers who were born between 1997 and 2012 may have cause for optimism. That's a good message, right? You're not hearing that in the news when you turn it on at night, I'll tell you that. They go on to say the path to Gen Z homeownership may have its own share of challenges, but that's not stopping Gen Z, nicknamed Zoomers, from buying homes. In fact, some Gen Z real estate trends are pointing in an optimistic direction. According to a recent study from a major real estate brokerage, about 30% of 25-year-olds own their homes in 2022, 2 to 3% ahead of both millennials and Gen X at the same age. Now, listen, I'm not saying that, that Gen Z is making up this enormous amount of, of uh, buyers and sellers right now. We, we have the numbers. Uh, it's about 5%, 3% of transactions in 2023, 2% of sellers uh, were in Gen Z, but they are out there and that number will grow. That is my message. Over the next five years, that number will grow. It's imperative that we get our message out there through video, through all the platforms that they are watching to help educate them. They want the education on how do I buy a home because many are wondering, am I going to even be able to do that? So a couple of things that you can educate people on uh, right now relative to Gen Z and home ownership. First, upping your financial literacy. You know, I think this is, a, is an area about how home ownership works. How does the mortgage process work? What are mortgage options through alternative financing, through maybe buy downs? I just talked to somebody about a buy down uh, on the uh, How's the Market podcast. Maybe it's even through so, some incentives that are offered. How, you know, how do you understand that financially? Trying to start saving now. You know, the, the key to, to buying a, a home certainly is being able to um, uh, pay the acquisition cost, the down payment, the closing cost, all the things that are associated with buying a home and saving today will help somebody do that in the future. And listen, if you think that's not an option for you, if you think homeownership is not an option, maybe you don't save. And I think our message should be clear with folks that they do need to save. They need to start today because they can uh, buy a home. Uh, third, keep an open mind. You, you know, I think looking at where are there areas and opportunity in the market, maybe it's something you can buy and put a little bit of sweat equity in and uh, fix something up and get a home, um, you know, to a place that you say, hey, look, this is mine. I put, I put this in there and I got a deal on it or I, I, I got uh, something that was a great value and keeping an open mind on it, doing your research. And that's where we come in. We can be the educators that help people uh, do their research on the market. So if I'm I'm thinking, uh, you know, my oldest is 22, he's thinking about, okay, am I going to be able to buy a home? And where he's going to be, where he's going to live, is he connected to someone that's going to help him understand the market, save and be prepared for when that day comes? That's the next wave of buyers that we have coming into the market. You know, Director's Mortgage said this, the path to home ownership may not be a straightforward one for Gen Z, but it's undoubtedly within reach. That is key. By adopting the right strategies, like exploring down payment assistance programs and sharing living costs with relatives, you can bring your dream of owning a home closer to reality. Don't forget to engage a reliable mortgage expert to guide you through this exciting journey. Your dream home is closer than you think. And listen, my message to anybody listening that's a loan officer or an agent, that, that a great 
Lending advisor, lender partner, and a great agent working together is the solution for Gen Z. No doubt about it. Help them understand how do you go out and buy a house, help them understand what the costs are, help them understand how you navigate it, what the options are. That is, that is no doubt. You know, many that are, that are in this category expect to receive some sort of help. You know, according to Redfin, more than a third of Gen Z and millennials that plan to buy expect to get a cash gift from their family to help fund their down payment. You know, I, I think certainly those uh, those folks that have that advantage, that is a good thing. Um, and we want to see them be able to, to do that uh, and uh, and move forward with the dream of homeownership. But let me give you a, a gift here uh, for, for the next minute or so before Kate joins and talks all about mortgage rates. Because, listen, that's driving uh, a, a big piece of affordability or the lack of affordability. Uh, and we want to be educated on that. But here's a... a a gift that I want to give you. There are resources available, and and one of the great resources, uh, and you can write this down if you, you have something to write with, is downpaymentresource.com. You know, so downpaymentresource.com. It's in this slide. Uh, the the link is in the notes to their website. You can go on that site and it's broken down by the area of the country you're in. I think you can break it down by zip code or, or, or uh, maybe it's county. I'm not sure. Over 2,000, you know, affordable mortgage programs, down payment assistance programs that are available, grant programs that are available that oftentimes people don't even know exist. You know, 39% of the programs over there are for repeat buyers. So it's not just first time buyers. And 75% of the down payment programs, you know, provide, you know, down payment and closing cost assistance. There are things out there that will help people if they will tap into them and they will educate themselves. And, and for anybody listening, educate yourself. Go to downpaymentresource.com. They're a phenomenal organization. Uh, I've known Rob Crane that started that business for, gosh, 15, 20 years now. And they exist to really expose the programs that help people buy. I mean, that's a, it's a wonderful thing that I think each one of us could do. Um, people that we work with a tremendous favor and tremendous benefit by educating ourselves uh, on that, you know, bottom line with, with the affordability issues in Gen Z, um, Chris Porter from John Burns said this at their core, Gen Z still aspires to home ownership and that will happen maybe later for them because housing affordability is a big challenge right now. I think it's a challenge we can navigate. One of the things that is key to navigating that is understand what is happening right now with mortgage rates. And nobody better than Kate Resbeck from our team to walk you through everything right now so that you can be the advisor to the clients you serve. So I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Thanks, David. We're going to be talking next about what's the latest on mortgage rates, especially coming out of the latest Fed meeting and what we're seeing in employment data and inflation. This is really mission critical to start with. So I'm going to begin with this quote from Nicole at Zillow. It says, the biggest thing when we're looking at mortgage rates right now is volatility. We have been talking about that word for quite some time. We are in a volatile mar market, especially when it comes to mortgage rates. That's everything we're going to unpack right now. And the bottom line is that it is going to take a little bit longer for mortgage rates to come down. But we're going to follow the economic drivers. We're going to follow all the indicators to continue to bring that information to you so you can have the latest data, the latest insights to be able to explain this volatility to your clients. Because when your clients understand why this is happening, it alleviates that fear that can start to build up for sure. So let's take a quick look at this mortgage rate volatility. This is the daily mortgage rate going back to October of 2023. We remember when mortgage rates kind of peaked around that 8%. We saw them coming down at the beginning of the year as we saw all these economic indicators, inflation and other things starting to show some relief for mortgage rates. We got into that downward trending environment and now we're starting to see mortgage rates tick back up a little bit, but we even saw a little relief on Friday. So, so much has happened in this time and I wanna make sure you have the data and the insights and the education to really understand it so you can explain it for your clients because there's a lot of things that go into 
how mortgage rates are determined. And I think this quote from Odetta Cushy really, really says it well. She says, every month brings a new set of inflation and labor data that can influence the direction of mortgage rates, ongoing inflation deceleration, a slow economy, and even geopolitical uncertainty can contribute to lower mortgage rates. On the other hand, data that signals upside risk to inflation may result in higher rates. So there's so many different factors that come into this. You know, a lot of people think the Federal Reserve sets mortgage rates. It's not that simple. And those are some of the things I want to share with you. Because there's really three things that you can kind of be looking at right now to understand what are those leading indicators on where mortgage rates go. The first thing you want to be looking at, of course, is inflation. We talk about this all the time. You know, we say inflation is the enemy of long-term interest rates. When inflation is high, mortgage rates tend to be high. There's a lot in there to be following when it comes to inflation data. The Fed's decision. We're going to break down a lot of what happened last week in the Fed meeting, what they've been saying over the past couple of months, what the indicators are going forward. You know, as the Federal Reserve makes moves on the federal funds rate, that's a reflection of what's happening in the broader economy and mortgage rates will respond. And then geopolitical events. You know, there's a lot happening in the world around us that impact the economy, that you know, that move these things in the financial markets. And so it's really important to be looking at those things, inflation, the Fed, and geopolitical events. And I think that Nerd Wallet also says it really well. This quote says, mortgage rates are influenced by many elements, including the inflation rate, the pace of job creation, and whether the economy is growing or shrinking. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy is a factor too, and it's set by the Federal Open Market Committee. So we've heard a lot of talk about that uh, Federal Reserve decision last week. We saw the jobs report come out on Friday. We're gonna dig into all of that and talk about how that impacts mortgage rates today. So before we jump into the Fed decision, let's remember mortgage rates are indirectly influenced by the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. When the central bank raises the federal funds target rate as it did throughout 2022 and 2023, that is a knock-on effect by causing short-term interest rates to go up. So they don't actually set mortgage rates, but as we mentioned, their actions indicate what's happening in the broader economy and mortgage rates respond. That's kind of that knock-on effect you see called out in this quote right here. And sometimes these changes are priced in as the markets anticipate what the Federal Reserve is going to decide. Sometimes they're a reaction as mortgage rates respond after the Fed meeting. We see all of that in motion. So when these factors kind of come together, that's where we see mortgage rates start to move. So what did the Fed do last week? Well, the latest Fed decision on May 1st was that the committee decided to maintain the target range for the federal fund rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. So basically what they, they've been doing over the past couple of years, we've heard us talk about this for a while, is the Federal Reserve has been raising the federal funds rate. They've been trying to slow the economy they saw some of that happen, starting to really reflect in the inflation data last year. So they started to say, OK, we're going to pause our rate hikes for the federal funds rate. So, you know, raising the federal funds rate essentially makes it more expensive to borrow money. They decided to pause. We saw that reflected in the broader economy. We saw it reflected in how mortgage rates responded towards the end of last year as they started to kind of tick down a little bit. And what they've seen over the past couple of months as more inflation data has come out in particular was, hey, we need a little more time. You know, there was an anticipation that the Federal Reserve may be starting to cut the federal funds rate in the first half of this year. And they're saying, you know what, we need to see some more definitive trends in a slowing of the economy for that to happen. So while we thought and a lot of experts thought that, you know, maybe the federal funds rate would be cut earlier in this year, um, it's going to take a little bit more time. And that's that knock-on effect as they look at the economic indicators that will drive their decision. So what are they looking at going forward? This is the big, the big question. So the Federal Reserve said the committee's assessment will take into account a wide range of information, including readings on labor market conditions, inflation pressures, and inflation expectations, and financial and international developments. So all the things we just laid out as these are the factors that impact mortgage rates, the Federal Reserve is going to continue to follow. And they need a little bit more time to see the trends that they're looking for, the slowing economic trends that they want to see before they cut the federal funds rate. So 
what happened on Friday. They came out of the Federal Reserve meeting on Wednesday, and then on Friday, the labor data was released. And I want to show you what came out of that. So CNBC said that U.S. economy added fewer jobs than expected in April, while the unemployment rate rose, lifting hopes that the Federal Reserve will be able to cut interest rates in the coming months. So good news. Non-farm payrolls increased by 175,000 on the month below the 240,000 estimate from the Dow Jones consensus. The unemployment rate ticked higher to 3.9% against expectations it would hold steady at 3.8%. So more jobs added to the economy, but not as many as expected. So that is a cooling sign, strong labor market, but a cooling sign that the Federal Reserve will be looking for. Same thing with unemployment rate. Thought it would come in at 3.8%, came in at 3.9%, so a little bit higher, another strong but cooling factor. And it's these cooling factors that they're really trying to look for to see when will we be able to cut the federal funds rate. And I think some context is really helpful on this too. This is a graph that we put together uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's the unemployment rate. And it really has changed very little. You can see over on the right that it ticked up ever so slightly uh, in this last reading, but certainly not even near the long-term average, certainly not back to where those red bars were when we saw such high unemployment back in the pandemic. But the unemployment rate ticked up just enough to say, hey, maybe there's a cooling factor on the horizon. You know, every time we look at unemployment data, it's always fascinating to dig in and see where did we see some of the trends? What industries or sectors might have been impacted? Education and health services were some of the places where we saw job growth, retail and transportation, you know, not, not unexpected as we come into these summer months. And then the one that caught my eye was construction and manufacturing. So adding jobs to the construction and manufacturing market is really good news for the housing market too, as we start to talk about what's ahead for new construction, for kind of starting to overcome some of these deficits that we're seeing in inventory. So really interesting leading indicators. We certainly see that labor market has cooled, but it is still strong and that is certainly a factor to look at. Danielle Hale from Realtor.com says, today's cooler labor market data is a sign that mortgage rate relief could be on the horizon, but that will be dependent on inflation. We're gonna talk about inflation in just a moment. We may see an unseasonably active summer and fall if inflation improves and mortgage rates drop. So as we see some of these cooling factors in the labor market, we continue to watch where inflation is um, and that coming down. You know, those are the things that will be drivers to uh, cut the federal funds rate and then ultimately some of those knock on effects that you see that start to, to bring mortgage rates down. So it's all these factors that we gotta watch. And that's what KCM does is we watch these for you so you can come to one place to really understand what does it all mean when they all come together. Now let's talk about inflation for a moment because this is something you've heard us really hit on a lot over the past couple of years. You know, inflation today continues to exceed the Federal Reserve's target rate. You can see that target rate across the bottom at 2%. We're certainly not where we were when it was nearly 9% um, back in July of 22, but over the past couple of years, raising the federal funds rate has helped to bring, um, you know, that slowing of the economy, inflation is coming down. Uh, but what happened over the past couple of readings, you can see those two orange bars on the right, inflation came in higher than expected. So not significantly higher, but not the cooling effect or the deceleration even that, um, that the Federal Reserve was looking for in February and March as they kind of went into the, the latest Federal Reserve meeting. So what we're seeing is that as inflation is high, mortgage rates tend to stay high and they're looking for a little bit more time to bring inflation down and to see those readings come in a little bit lower. And I think that's really kind of what we want to keep our eye on as we talk about all these different factors to watch. Inflation is definitely one of them. Uh, and I think this quote right here says it very well. 
The FOMC did not change the federal funds target at its May meeting as incoming data regarding the strength of the economy and stubbornly high inflation have resulted in a shift in the timing of a first rate cut. We expect mortgage rates to drop later this year, but not as far or as fast as we previously had predicted. So that is the general consensus of, you know, the reactions of coming out of uh, inflation data, the Federal Reserve meeting, all of those things that we've been watching is that mortgage rates are still expected to come down, but not as far or as fast as we had previously uh, previously expected. And that was right from the Mortgage Bankers Association and you know, continuing to watch that inflation data to see what's happening and where that leads us. And I think if you take a look at these uh, federal funds rate increases that we've seen over the past two years, you can see that they were much more aggressive going back to, you know, May, June, July of 2022. They started to ease off as we saw progress and inflation starting to come down. And then you can see those rate pauses over on the right side of the screen where the Federal Reserve is saying, OK, we're close but we're not there yet. We need a little bit more time. And that's exactly what they said in their latest meeting. We need a little bit more time. And what I wanna do now is show you another really uh, couple of powerful visuals because the why on why they need a little bit more time is really, really impactful. So here's a quote from Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, last month. And he said, reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of progress we have seen in inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. So what does that mean? You know, we can't move too quickly. We have to continue to watch the data. And this next visual is the one that's going to really explain why. So let's sit on this one for a moment. This is the CPI going back to 1970. So one of the measures of inflation that the Federal Reserve looks at. And what you can see is back in the 1970s, the early 70s, um, inflation was rising. And that's what you see in that left oval over there. Inflation was kind of ticking up. And so what the Federal Reserve had to do was raise the, the federal funds rate to bring inflation down. So you can see that that happened, the first peak and valley. And then what happened back then was that they decided to cut the federal funds rate, but they did it just a little too early. So this is one of the big reasons reasons why the Federal Reserve today is saying we need more time, because when they cut too early, inflation spiked back up and they had to start that work all over again. We certainly don't want to be in that position today. So fast forward over to the right side of the screen and you can see that other oval, that smaller one. That's where we're working at today is inflation was rising. They started to increase the federal funds rate. Inflation started to come down, and as the last couple of readings came in just a touch higher than they expected, they said, hold on, we don't want to repeat history. We don't want this to happen again. So they're going to buy a little bit more time to make sure that they're really seeing those consistent trends of a slowing in the economy. And that's a big, big reason why they're taking this, you know, take their time uh, approach right now. And if you look at what Jerome Powell said coming out of last week's meeting, he said, my personal forecast is that we will begin to see further progress on inflation this year. I don't know that it will be sufficient. I don't know that it won't. I think we're going to have to let the data lead us on that. So that is watching all of these economic drivers. They're watching inflation. They're watching employment all the different things that impact their decision. And they're going to take a little bit more time to make sure they do it right. And so everybody's wondering, when does the next federal funds rate cut come? Well, we can watch some really interesting market data to get perspective on you know, what's trending in the financial markets. And this is from uh, the CME group. And it says that uh, there's a 69.6% .6 chance that the Fed cuts at the September meeting. Now, at the beginning of the year, there was hope that maybe that cut would come earlier in the year and that would start to have that knock-on effect on mortgage rates coming down, maybe even toward the end of the spring market into the summer. I think it is much more likely as we watch these trends that it's going to be later in the year. How many cuts, of course, still to be determined, but roughly a 70% chance, as this uh, market watch tool says, 
that the Fed will cut at its September meeting. But let's be really honest, this data is changing constantly. And that's why I want to show you this next slide, because it's really interesting on how these economic factors can change the outlook so quickly. The odds of a September cut one a little over a month ago, if you look over to the left side of the screen, were almost 90%. You know, everybody was saying, yeah, September, we're going to be we're going to be cutting rates by then. Well, coming into the end of April, as we're continuing to watch inflation data in particular, percentage started to tick down. Going into the Federal Reserve meeting last week on April 30th, the odds people were saying and experts were saying was roughly about 45%. Coming out of the meeting on May 1st, the next day, odds started to tick back up. And then we saw employment data be released, strong but cooling labor market toward the end of the week on the third. And then even today, odds of a September rate cut ticking back up. So this is a great leading indicator on perspective of what might be coming as we look later into the year. Now, there's always the question, too, of, well, could the Federal Reserve actually hike rates again? Could they tighten monetary policy further? And Jerome Powell said directly, I think it's unlikely that the next policy rate move will be a hike. So that's really good news as we think about what does all this mean for mortgage rates as we watch geopolitical events, as we watch inflation, as we watch um, job trends, all of those different things. What does this mean for rates, mortgage rates in particular going forward? Well, we have the latest projections from some of the key experts that we follow. And really what they're saying, if you average out Fannie Mae, MBA, and NAR, the latest projections that we have from the end of April is that mortgage rates should continue to trend down this year. If you look at um, you know, that green bar that just came up around the screen, Q quarter four of this year, Q1, Q2 of next year, below that six and a half percent mark and maybe down even next year into the high sixes now again we saw that quote earlier it's not as fast or as far as we originally predicted but uh, a lot of the experts are saying that's because we're still continuing to watch the economic data watch what the fed is doing watch what the experts are saying where all these factors come together so if we can keep our eyes on what's happening right now what does this mean going forward? And as agents, be able to bring this perspective as the educator of here's what the latest data says and how it's changing. That's the best way to educate, educate clients right now to prove value, to be the trusted advisor, you know, working with a trusted lender right now in a volatile market, mission, mission critical to have those partners to help navigate through this, to talk through what's happening and why and what are all these factors but the good news is we're still in a downward trending environment and if you look at what mba says they are projecting uh, mortgage rates to continue to come down this year and next as we watch these economic factors impact where they are going uh, so definitely in that downward trending environment i think as we look at what all the experts are saying we have to remember Mortgage rates are the toughest thing to project in the housing market. Look at all these factors we talked about today. Everything is kind of coming together in this puzzle, and it's moving constantly as the economic data changes. So yes, a downward trending environment. Experts are saying they will continue to come down, uh, but they are the hardest thing to project. And the best thing to do is bring the most current data to your clients and help explain the why. Because what we also know is that more people are starting to think that mortgage rates might not come down. They're seeing all this talk, all this chatter, all the headlines about inflation and everything that's happening. And the percent of respondents who think mortgage rates will go down in the next 12, month, 12 months actually went down in March as a lot of this was circulating around the news. So January, February, 36, 35% of consumers felt like, yeah, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. They were starting to see mortgage rates tick down and they were saying, yep, I believe that this is going to happen. Well, that percentage dropped in March. And that's where the confusion and the fear and the, I'm just gonna press pause on my plans starts to really hit your clients. So being able to understand that consumer perspective and communicate that out 
is mission critical because that's how we remove the fear. That's why we help people understand why things are happening. Because as Bright MLS says, expect rates to come down in the second half of 2024, but remain above 6% this year. Even a modest drop in rates will bring both more buyers and more sellers back into the market. And that's really important to talk about because it's going to change the mindset of consumers as they start to see rates come down. And that's gonna change what's happening in the housing market. And I love this graph that we use that uh, shows demand based on rate environment. And this is a really strong analysis of what's happening in the 30 year fixed mortgage rate. You can see that white line that's coming across your screen going all the way back to the beginning of the year. That's the daily mortgage rate. And you can see how demand changes based on where rates are. Bottom line, when rates come down, demand increases. We saw that in the beginning of February, as you can see kind of over on the left side of the screen. When rates came down, we definitely saw more demand in the market. We saw purchase applications go up. As rates start to tick back up, you know, we're not at 8% anymore, that's for sure, but they're higher than they were a couple months ago. Demand starts to weaken. And so really understanding how people act in these environments and being able to communicate with their clients on what does this mean is mission critical because, you know, you can have conversations all day about, hey, clients, mortgage rates are projected to come down. Here's what all the data says and what the experts are saying. And if someone turns to you and says, that's great, I'll just wait, then you want to be able to ask a really important question. And that important question is, what do you think everyone else is going to do? You ask that question and people start to realize, well, as rates come down, all this pent up demand that we might be feeling right now, this competition for limited inventory, people are going to jump back in the market. It's not going to be the floodgates of what we had when there were 3% mortgage rates, but we're certainly going to see more people jump into those good and strong buying demands as rates come into below six and a half. And even below 6% is going to bring a lot of buyers back to the market. So if someone's waiting for mortgage rates to come down, being able to talk to them about what does that mean? It means more competition among other buyers, more multiple offer scenarios, harder to find a home potentially, and prices continuing to rise as buyer demand goes up and inventory is still constrained. Sure, we'll see more houses coming to the market at that point too, but it doesn't make it easier to find one at that point. So we wanna be able to help people who are ready, willing, and able today to buy, realize here's what the data says and what that means for the market if they really want to make a powerful and informed decision going forward. We never want to push anybody into buying a home by any means, but we certainly want to give them the perspective to be able to make an informed decision, not just a wait and see decision. That's where your value as the educator is absolutely priceless because we know there's going to be a mindset shift as rates come down back into the sixes, back into the low sixes, and certainly below 6% even into next year. So a lot to talk about, a lot to consider as we have these conversations with our clients. And as you always hear us say, most agents know that this is happening. It is very clear what's happening in the market. The good agents really understand it and the great agents can explain it. And if you can take this information, share the visuals, talk to your clients and get this message out there, that is going to be the game changer for you and for your business. So really making sure that you are able to explain what's happening.